So thank you all for being here. It's a, it's a real treat to introduce you all to, to Laura Manager. I'm Brandon Garrett. Some of you don't know me because maybe you're in John Beskin's evidence class, but I see many of my evidence students here, and many, many of you are not in either of our evidence classes. Uh, so uh, Laura Manager is a Duke Arts and Sciences alum. Went to a different law school, but some people made that choice. I don't know why. Um, Laura, nationally recognized trial lawyer, uh, partner at had at Morgan Foreman in Denver, and uh, when I visited their lovely offices, they all had a Duke men's basketball game on the screen, and we're celebrating a trial victory. Uh, but I think they do that every day, and celebrate trial victory. Uh, Never lose. Never yeah. And uh, I'll bring out more of uh, Laura's background in the Q&A. I told my evidence students, but some of you are not lucky enough to be there, uh, that we really want questions from you all. Uh, so we are not going to take up the full lunch hour talking with each other. We, we want you to jump in and, you know, if, if Laura says something that sparks something like, this is like class, raise your hand, volunteers, it's good. Um, Laura is also here because Laura is one of the advisory board members for our Wilson Center of Science and Justice, which some of you may not know well. Some of you have worked with the center. We do empirical criminal justice research and policy work. Uh, also want to recognize uh, the chair of our advisory board and you know, the namesake of the Wilson Center is the Wilson Center Foundation. Derek Wilson is here. And we have other board members here too. Uh, we have Steve Leifman. Judge Leifman has been uh, done incredible work on, on around behavioral health, which is an important focus of our center. We work a lot with the medical school and on, on that subject and many other topics. Judge Leifman has just been an enormously valuable and helpful advisor. Uh, and Barry Sheck is here. Some of you may have heard of Barry as well. Um, also has, has some renown as a trial lawyer, and, including because he was the, my, my first boss as a lawyer. And the, the first trial that I worked on was to assist as like a distant chair, a third or fourth chair, fourth chair maybe, uh, uh, the chair in the back. Um, that, that helped to shield me from the judge's wrath. The uh, uh, first trial experience was, was with Barry, and, uh, and Barry also an advisor to the Wilson Center and a great friend of our work here at, at Duke Law. So um, we're really pleased to be with you all. I'm going to sit down so that we're more in like Q and A mode. Uh, and so the first question I wanted to ask was. Uh, backing up before the stage of life that you're all in as law students is you know, always want to think about like, well, why, why does someone go to law school? And so what, what was it about, what was it in the water uh, during your experience at Duke as an undergrad that made you want to then go to, to law school? The particular experiences, the particular contacts, uh, like what, what made you want to go to law school? When I was in Seventh grade, I think I read a book. I checked a book from the Macon, Georgia Public Library called Confessions of a Criminal Defense Lawyer. It was a terrible book, terrible book, but it was the first time I remember being kind of captured by um, arguments about fairness and justice. Um, when I was at Duke, I was a public policy major, and I had a constitutional law class, which also was very uh, compelling to me, sort of this notion that litigation can shape policy, especially in the area of constitutional rights. Um, we use Jerry Gunther's constitutional law treatise, and when I got to law school later, he was my professor, and I was like, oh my god, I'm meeting the guy that wrote the book. Um, <laughs> but probably the most formative experience I can think of, I'm a tremendous introvert, and, um, and conflict uh, adverse person, which doesn't naturally make you think you want to be a litigator. Um, I was in an ethics class, a PPS ethics class, and there was an older gentleman who'd been brought in as a guest lecturer, former CEO of a major company. And in that class, you know, very close to where we're sitting right now, um, I had this experience, this is the late 80s, and he kept calling on all of the men in the classroom. Like whenever he had, it was a smaller class, and he would call on men, he would ask a question, when they disagreed with him, he would, you know, banter with them, ask follow-up questions, and just wasn't calling on the women. So I started keeping track of like how many times he was calling on men, and what happened when he called on a woman, or a woman volunteered, and there was no follow-up. So one day, 
I was just couldn't take it anymore. The injustice of that situation just overcame all of my introversion, and I just said, you know, I've noticed something in this classroom, and I've been keeping track here, and this is what I've observed. And it was actually, ironically, a class about um, challenging uh, leaders and you know, <laughs> in, uh, what happened in My Lai in Vietnam, where people just went along with the leaders and didn't question the leaders. So to me, it seemed appropriate that I would challenge him. It did not go well. <laughs> he was very defensive and very upset. But actually, it led to some better dialogue in the classroom. And I remember just that first feeling of like overcoming your fear to a point where you're willing to speak up and you're willing to take action. And for me, it was kind of like, I've got to do this. It, it, I can't be quiet anymore. So I kind of reconfigured my thinking. Like maybe I can do something where I'm, you know, more um, present and more. I give voice to the people who don't have a voice. Um, I did not go immediately to law school. I took my LSATs in college um, before I left, but I had a little diversion to Wall Street because they were hiring at Duke in 91, and um, I just applied for every job where someone came to campus and got that job um, at Goldman Sachs. My mother thought I was going to get a discount at Saks Fifth Avenue. <laughs> Neither she nor I knew what investment banking was. Um, but while I was at Goldman Sachs, I was definitely uh, not the corporate type. And I kept asking questions, and why are we doing it this way? And I organized a women's group because we weren't allowed to wear pantsuits. And I didn't understand why we couldn't wear pantsuits. So after that, I all my friends went to business school, and I went to law school. So. And when we went to law school early on, we were thinking trial lawyer. Yeah. I thought I, I knew corporate more from my job, and I had studied international relations, and I speak Japanese, and I thought I was going to do some kind of trade negotiations. I'd written a senior thesis on rice trade negotiations in college. So I thought I was going to join the joint program with John Hopkins and do international relations, and I took uh, international law class. I don't think I knew what that was either, and I was like bored out of my mind and knew like there's no way I want to do this. And then by contrast, I had some really amazing professors at the other law school, uh, particularly a woman named Barbara Babcock. We can name Stanford Law School. Okay, Stanford Law School. My staff carry rooms overlap. Yes, I exactly. I went to school with uh, the dean here. Um, and Barbara Babcock had helped found the Public Defender Services in D.C. back in the 70s. Um, and I thought it was the greatest sounding job I had ever heard of. Um, Brian Stevenson came to speak at Stanford. I remember where I was sitting in the classroom when he gave his speech, which many of you may have seen on TED Talks or HBO documentaries or any of the other places. I was places. here last, last fall. And was here last fall. Um, and you know, you can't really leave that room without a feeling like you should be doing more, you should be speaking up, you should be uh, helping give voice. So those were, and then when I was a third year in law school, I became a federal defender intern in San Francisco. So that was when I really started practicing in the area of criminal defense. What kinds of things could you do as a, as a Yeah, CEO? you know what? Uh, they charge misdemeanors in federal court. And so they, they let the interns do things like nude sunbathing in the Presidio or uh, <laughs> DUIs and driving on federal territory around uh, San Francisco. So we got to you know, visit clients in custody, we got to argue bonds, we got to do some more basic, the things you did when you were fourth chair to bury <laughs> Yeah, lots of issues can come up in misdemeanor Absolutely. cases at our, at our new Absolutely. criminal defense clinic. Yeah. Misdemeanor cases in district court can raise a surprising, surprising array it's of a, issues. It's a good place to learn to do misdemeanors, for sure. Mm -hmm. How about some of the trial exposure? I mean, did it push you farther on the path towards trial law of uh, uh, working for Judge Kaplan? Yeah, I clerked for Lewis Kaplan in the Southern District of New York, I who now has the Sam Bankman Freed case and featuring his parents who are both my professors <laughs> and lovely professors I might add. Uh, uh, so 
Yeah, Judge Kaplan had a lot of, he has and had a lot of high profile cases. I, I applied only for appellate um, clerkships and one trial clerkship. And he was the one trial judge I spoke to and it's one of those, it, it became increasingly clear to me I was not an appellate lawyer and I did not want to become a professor and I did not want to become a judge. So um, when I spoke to Judge Kaplan in his chambers, it was like, he offered me the job on the spot and I accepted on the spot and you know, being, being in a courtroom, either it's something that really appeals to you or it doesn't. But if you're one of those people who uh, likes drama, um, <laughs> the trial level was a great place to be and New York was a great place. There were a lot of trials. There was uh, Fabio, you guys are way too young to know Fabio. Do you remember Fabio? <laughs> he had an excellent case going on in the courtroom that so we would go watch all the other trials, not just the ones in our court. Fabio was on trial? Fabio, it was a civil case, yeah. Not a criminal case. <laughs> And then, and so, and, and, and I think it's also helpful for our students here. We've worked at several different types of firms slash offices and done very different work at each. And lots of our students are trying to decide, like, what's the right home for me as a, as a lawyer? Um, so, place number one was Paul Weiss, right? After, after clerking. Yeah, so I kind of approached the practice of law from sort of um, more drilling down on different skill sets. You know, you don't really know where your career is going to take you. The more skills that you possess, the more flexible your career can be, the more opportunistic it can be, the more interesting things that come along you might be, um, you might be compelled to follow. You will be able to have those opportunities if you can do different things. So Paul Weiss was, a, you know, it's still a great a litigation shop. Back then it had smaller cases than it does today. Um, but there were a lot of good trial lawyers there. You certainly learn to write very well, very persuasively. You have people who are willing to take the time to critique your writing and help you become a better writer. I think being a good researcher and writer is what, I mean, it's the foundation of being a great lawyer. I don't care what you do, where you do it, you need to hone those skills. And unfortunately, if you start out your career being a public defender, for example, there's no one who has the time to give you feedback on your writing. You're not, you know, it's not that they don't want to help you or mentor you. They just have hundreds of cases and no one is reading your work. Basically, the judges may not be reading your work. Um, sometimes the other side reads your work, but I can't even say that they read it. No. Not all, some judges read all, right. all of them. Um, but at least in Colorado, some of my... Some of my state judges, you can tell as soon as you get into the oral argument that you need to repeat things that you already put in writing. Um, but I think becoming a great researcher and writer, which you're already starting on that journey as law students, um, really should continue in your first job. And you need to find a place, if it's not your job, and some other place to become a great writer. Paul Weiss was that, that. I also met a lot of fabulous people there. Um, Hakeem Jeffries was in my class. He's now the majority um, leader in the House of Representatives. Um, Debo Adegale later become the, became the head of uh, NAACP Legal <coughs> Fund. I mean, there, it's just, there are people who are drawn to big law firms, even if they're going to go somewhere else later. So unlike some of you, but probably like many of you, I also had to pay off law school debt. I did not have parents who were paying for my law school. Stanford was not cheap. Um, so I used that time in New York to save my money um, and pay off my debt in about four years. Um, and then 9-11 uh, happened and I had a son who was born just before 9-11 and after that I was like, I always wanted to be a public defender and I don't know when you see people when you're in the city, when you watch that go down, you're like, there may not be a time in my life to do the job I always wanted to do. So having paid off my debt, we moved to Colorado, um, my husband and I and my newborn, and I applied to become a deputy public defender there, which is the best job. I mean, I can't do it justice like Barbara Babcock did to our class, but in terms of helping people, learning to speak on your feet, 
I'd worked at a law firm where you didn't get to talk in a courtroom until you were a partner. I mean, I saw people who were nine-year litigation associates who'd never been in a trial or never, you know, they'd taken some depositions, but they'd never done stand-up. I walked into a county court courtroom and there was an intern who handed me a stack of files and there was no other public defender around and I had to get trained by this intern. Like, I didn't know where to stand, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I mean, I'd come straight from a law firm in New York thinking I knew all that and the people are asking me, I got a hot UA, what should I do? And I was like, I'm sorry, <laughs> what is a UA? Oh, a positive urinalysis, I see. You know, and, uh, or ask me about what effect a plea was gonna have on the points on their license, and I didn't know the first thing about points on licenses. But um, I learned quickly, it was either me speaking or nobody speaking, you know? It was like, oh, would, you, would this person be better off by themselves, pro se, or can I figure out what I'm saying on the fly? And so it took a lot of that fear of public speaking, a lot of the fear of talking in court, um, and you just learn to just go. I mean, you meet someone and you're arguing bail for them and they really want to get out and they really want a lower bond so they can post the bond, so they can go back to work, so they can go back to their families, so they can, you know, live their life while they're awaiting trial. And you have to just be able to absorb a lot of information quickly and repeat it to a judge in a persuasive manner and mean it. And you just start doing it. You just jump in and go. I'm, I think all of the clinical programs that you have here and that they now have at Stanford, they did not have when I was there, are, I mean, I see kids who come out of the clinical programs ready to be, you know, they're, they're way ahead of where I was, even though I had clerked for a federal judge and looked at Paul Weiss. You know, they're like, boom, 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 know the law, um, know how to do it. So that those were the skills that I developed as a public defender. I brought a lot of writing to that job that not everyone brought because I had come from a writing background. Um, ultimately, I left and went to a law firm in Denver. I had small children, happy to talk about how you make life work as a working mother litigator, which is not easy, or, or parent. Um, and so when my daughter was, my kids were young, I had my own solo practice for a while, and then I joined my current firm about <coughs> 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Let me ask, let's, let's start talking about some evidence issues. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> this is like a pop quiz from hell. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm back to my law school fear days. So, we were talking about a 609A1B now. Uh, uh, but I, there are judges, there are federal judges. I know you can only use the number of the rule. You cannot, right. you, you have to know the numbers. And you, know the numbers. It, it, anything beyond that is a speaking objection. So. Uh, no, but I, I, I need to just in, in a broader question of like what, what were some of the, the, the challenging, just broadly speaking, evidence issues? Um, maybe going to the public, your public defense days when you when you're working on routine criminal cases. Um, some go to trial, many don't. What are, what are kind of some of the, 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 from a practical perspective, some of the hardest issues that that you have to grapple with? The kinds of cases that more frequently go to trial are sex cases, where there's a very significant lifelong punishment in the form of both imprisonment, but also registration and so forth. So the consequences are so high, those go to trial more frequently, and serious violent crimes. Um, you know, the statistics are many routine, you know, car thefts and whatnot just get dealt. And I know um, the great work that your, the center has done on uncovering the plea bargaining process. But, you know, I would say I won a lot of cases as a public defender at the motion stage, either through motions to suppress or other creative motions. Um, one that frequently came up, uh, had to do with child hearsay. So um, I don't think you've gotten hearsay, gotten hearsay yet. yet. Um, <laughs> we've, we've certainly mentioned that children can be witnesses. Yeah, There's children no, can be witnesses. No categorical bar. That's yeah. right. Um, they have competency hearings a lot, which are like, do you believe in Santa Claus? <laughs> you know, And if they say yes, you're like, well, can they really tell the truth? Um, <laughs> 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 
interviews of the child. Now it's routine that they are um, videotaped. I mean, there are standards for how to do these non-leading, non-suggestive questions, right? Tell me what happened, not did your dad touch your pee pee? That's not a good question to ask in a forensic interview. Um, but hearsay can come in in the event, well, sometimes it can come in without this event, but mostly the idea behind child hearsay is that a child may not be able to accurately uh, recall and report events when they're on the stand in a courtroom because the setting of a courtroom is intimidating, they may be six, five, whatever. So the idea behind child hearsay is to permit um, prior statements about the event to come in as substantive evidence. Now, while I was a public defender, Crawford was decided, so the rights to confront your accusers came into play, but at least that meant if the child was on the stand, they were subject to cross-examination, and they would bring in the prior videotaped interview of what happened. You can't cross-examine a videotape. It's very difficult to cross-examine a videotape. No, stop. No, you can't do that. So as long as the child is there and you can ask them about what they said earlier, the idea is the child hears it comes in. But we had to then litigate frequently what, um, whether the prior statement was reliable. So a non-suggestive interview at a forensic examination place where they're sitting on a couch and there's a two-way mirror, those can be perfectly legitimate places to take an interview. If it's a child of a divorce and the mother's interested in getting child custody and the mother is suspecting the father of wrongdoing, and starts to ask a lot of suggested leading questions to the child, that may not be so reliable. So you end up getting these evidentiary hearings before trial that really help you put a color on how the allegations came to light, whether there was suggestion involved. There's some really tragic cases that Barry has reported on, but certainly a lot of the eyewitness memory folks like Elizabeth Loftus have reported on that you know, false memories can be implanted in children's head and the, the way that the story came out is very important to the truther. Um, veracity of the ultimate statement. That's a big one. I, I won a trial once by just filing a motion for spousal disqualification. Can you talk about that in your reference? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so a certain levels of crimes, you can't call a spouse to testify against their um, husband. So one of my cases, I had a serial uh, purse snatcher. His MO was to wait at gas stations until a woman got out to pump gas and left her passenger door unlocked and all of us ladies apparently leave our purses on the passenger seat right next to us when we're pumping gas and he would drive up, snatch it and drive away. Um, the cops in this case just called the, they got the license plate and figured out that it belonged to a woman so they called her and said, who is driving your truck today? And she's like, oh, my husband had it. So we got ready for trial and they planned to call the wife to say that her husband was driving the truck at the time this purse snatching occurred. And I was like, not so much. <laughs> so the judge disqualified the wife from testifying. The prosecution went anyway. The wife sat in the front row during the entire trial with the prosecutor not being allowed to call her. Um, and that was a you know five minute acquittal, I'd say. Um, there's a lot of suppression issues. I mean, you can't say you've had fun until you're litigating a suppression issue. <laughs> I don't care if you're on the defense side or the prosecution side. It's just, it, you get to ask questions, you get to think about the Constitution, you get to talk about, you know, whether it was reasonable to have, you know, the stop extended for a longer period of time. I mean, those were the bread and butter kind of um, litigation questions that came up as a public defender. Make My Day was a big one. I had a big case. Let's Make My Day. Um, do you guys know what Make My Day is? Standard Ground? It's called different things across the country. Yeah, it's Committee's Woodline. It's Committee's Woodline, <laughs> right. Um, so Colorado, like many states, uh, has a law that if an intruder or someone trespasses into your house and you reasonably fear for your safety, you can basically a self-defense principle, um, but you can be immune from criminal responsibility. So if a burglar breaks into your house in Colorado, you can just shoot them if you're afraid that they're going to harm you or your family. Um, 
I'm and supposed to make my day a motion. And so you file, in order to get the immunity, you have to file pre-trial a make my day motion setting forth sufficient facts to trigger the statute. And then you can have a hearing on whether or not it applies in your circumstance. Um, the judge may grant a motion and dismiss the case, or they may find there's a, a disputed issue of fact as to the reasonableness, and then allow you to raise that as an affirmative defense at trial. Interesting, so you have to trigger it. Uh, you also mentioned creative motions. Is that one of them, or is that? Or no, what, that's what, pretty what, standard. What, what's the creative motion category? Um, well, I have a law partner now who is good at making up creative names for motions. So one of his motions was, warrant, warrant, who's got the warrant? <laughs> uh, <laughs> because they all got into the house and thought someone else had gotten a warrant, but no. <laughs> I guarantee you the judge read warrant, warrant, who's got the warrant? Because <laughs> uh, they don't see that one every day. Um, you know, I think if you're in a state criminal justice system, your duty is to be reading up on the law that's current and reading, you know, case slip sheets from the federal circuits and from other from other states. Um, my law firm, before I joined it, represented Kobe Bryant uh, in his legal troubles. Um, may he rest in peace. Um, and they filed a motion that later gained some nationwide traction about calling an accuser a victim. So if you're in a trial, can you can the prosecution or the judge or witnesses refer to the complaining witness as a victim? Um, when your whole entire trial, in some cases, like that case, is meant to decide the question of whether the individual is a victim. Mm -hmm. And where, where a lot of the state courts have since come <clears throat> down is, you know, obviously in a homicide, there's a victim. You may be arguing about who did it or how it was done or whether there was legal justification, but a dead person is invariably a victim. In a sex case, like I said, that goes to trial more frequently, um, many times the question is, was it consensual? Was it not consensual? If it was consensual, there really is no victim. So if a prosecutor is referring to the complaining witness as a victim, are they vouching for that person's Credibility is that really the prosecutor's opinion coming in the back door by saying I believe her That's why I'm calling her in most cases a victim um, it also is um, You know a standard premise of the law that no witness can comment on the credibility of another witness So if a judge is calling oh now the victim is taking the stand is the judge then essentially vouching for the credibility mm -hmm. that this was in fact a criminal act and not a consensual sexual encounter? Mm -hmm. So that you know motion in limine to exclude use of the term victim is something that was creative in its time, and now I've seen recently some very very solid um, state <clears throat> supreme courts um, finding that it steps over the line. Um, or limiting it to closing argument um, in cases where there's a question about it. I know you're also um, talking about 404B in your class. Something I did that I never saw anyone do before me, meaning I didn't come up with it on my own, I don't remember, is if you're introducing 404B evidence, what if there are suppression issues in the 404B evidence, right? So if they're trying to admit your client's confession from some prior event, that they're bringing into this trial in order to buttress the prosecution to buttress the case. Well, don't you get to litigate, it's like a meta litigation, but litigate the suppression question that was buried within the 404B evidence. And as soon as you start doing that, what you're really doing is getting a lot of hearings, which in criminal defense world is gold because there is no discovery like there are in civil cases. You don't have depositions except in Florida, apparently, in criminal cases. Mm -hmm. uh, you have depots in Florida. Yeah, yeah. I think you're the only one. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, great. If I had that, I wouldn't care so much about getting hearings. But, uh, when you, Missouri, what, too. Actually. Oh, Missouri. They don't do it. But they, 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 they can. can. They don't pay for the habit. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, just having hearings about uh, the 404B, hearing, having hearings about child hearsay, having hearings about 
anything about experts, um, the admissibility of expert testimony, is, in, is if you can find a way to get a hearing, you've already gotten yourself far down the path of doing your client a favor by vigorously defending uh, against the charges. Yeah, uh, I was wondering, it sounds, to what what extent are is most of the evidentiary work you're doing pre-trial yeah. as opposed to during trial, or is it even there? That's a really good question because there are arguments. My my instinct coming from a civil background was to do everything pre-trial. I think judges like it if you do it pre-trial. Mm -hmm. I think um, no one likes surprises. But I came to learn that surprise can be the defendant's best friend. So. Um, I had to curb that. Um, I certainly think anything you think that's going to come out in opening statements, you need to litigate um, before trial. As a public defender, that meant the morning of trial. Um, <laughs> motions in limine were always heard the morning of trial. Um, in larger cases with national scope, uh, there is a lot more pre-trial litigation you know, certainly excluding experts, you know, that's something you do well in advance. If you want a hearing on your motion to suppress, you got to do that in advance. Um, but even there, when I'm, when I was originally drafting motions, I was putting all my facts in there because to get a hearing in federal court, you need to have sufficient basis to get a hearing. Then I learned in state court in Colorado, at least you get a hearing just by filing the motion. So I was like, I remember the first time I saw a police officer preparing for my motions hearing, reading my motion where I had spelled out that the, you know, the stop went on too long, and then sure enough, he gets on the stand, he's like, oh, that stop was quick as it, you know, and I'm like, ah. Oh. So, that's why I said you learn a lot doing the misdemeanor cases, because, um, you know, you do a lot of DUIs and things that are misdemeanors. So, I, it really is a strategic call, in many cases, which motions, which evidentiary questions you want to raise pre-trial versus spring during trial. There are many, you know, I even when I'm writing a cross-examination for a trial, at the top I have, the, this is the likely direct testimony, here are the likely evidentiary issues that are going to come up, and here are the cases that I'm going to rely on, so that when I know invariably they say the thing that I think is objectionable, I'm ready to object with the number and stand up and give my case law at the bench if I need to. So those kinds of things I would do during the middle of trial. If I want a hearing, it's got to be before trial. So I have lots more questions, but I don't want to ask them. I want I want you all to 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 have a chance to ask lots of questions. Yes. Uh, it, w w we just learned about prior convictions, and I'm curious. Uh, was that it? Was something you dealt with? And like, did you were you more like leaning towards like not having a defendant yeah. testify and bring them in, or like? Yeah, or, or, or having them. It's certainly something you have to discuss with your, if your client is the one with the prior conviction, um, it's, a, it's a very good discussion to have. In Colorado, the fact of the conviction will come in, but not necessarily uh, what it's for. Mm -hmm. Or... Um, we talked about the state variations. Yeah. yeah. Not, I mean, you've been convicted of a felony before, and they're like, yes, I have. And then the judge's like, next question. So that's all that might happen. In other scenarios, you know, they get to bring in, oh, well, you know, you did this bad act before, and, you know, really put them on the stand. Really put them to the test talking about how they committed a prior crime. So if it's a case that's similar, like if you had a client charged with sex assault and they've previously been convicted of a sex assault, you know, you're probably going to want to keep that information from the jury. <clears throat> so you either eliminate what the conviction was for and say that's not the point of allowing a prior felony to come in. The point is to say because they have a prior felony, it's their credibility is in question if they testify. Um, and if the judge rules against you, then your client has to decide. Um, so that comes up in discussions. I mean. As a public defender, I would say most clients did not testify, so it did not come up as frequently. The two cases where it, the almost, your client almost always has to testify is in a consent sex case because how do you? It's hard to get out all of the uh, factors that go into consent without the client's testimony, and in self defense cases. I mean, it's hard to explain that you reasonably fear, fear for your life without some testimony. Then you have to prep your client to 
answer questions about their prior. So the common one is, well, yeah, in that case, I pled guilty because, you know, I didn't. But here, I'm testifying because I didn't, you know. So you come up with a reason why they pri the prior case was one where they had a conviction um, and be ready to explain it. Um, I, my personal experience as a defense lawyer is far more questioning prosecution witnesses about their priors, and that's just... Fun. I mean, <laughs> uh, let's start over here. First felony was when you were 18. Um, in gang cases, I mean, most of the times the witnesses have priors. I actually, my personal opinion, I don't think it matters that much to juries. I actually don't. I think there's been so much publicity, thankfully, around the fact that felonies follow you around for life and you can rehabilitate yourself that I'm not sure the juries, at least in Denver County, care that much whether witnesses have a prior felony. In some other jurisdictions, up in Dale, Dale might not like it. So you have to know your jury. You have to know what kind of jurors. You know, there are many jurors that have their own felonies. And in Colorado, that doesn't disqualify you. So I've had persons with felonies sit on our juries before, so they really don't care. I mean, they're like, I can sit here, you can sit up there, we all have felonies. Um, I, we have had some cases, I like 608, I'm a big fan of, I'm a big 608 fan, I don't know, <laughs> show of hands. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody loves 608 as much as I do. Um, there, you know, that's one where you don't necessarily, it doesn't even have to be a conviction, so there was a, a big case in Colorado where a 14-year-old was an accuser, and the defense attorney tried to examine her about her <coughs> shoplifting. She had committed shoplifting, which is a crime of moral turpitude. It's theft. It shows dishonesty. And the judge was so angry that this was being asked under 608 that he cut the trial off, you know, declared a mistrial, <laughs> like just went way above board. And the college Supreme Court was like, what are you talking about? That's clearly a crime of moral turpitude. Barred re-prosecution. They found it was a double jeopardy violation for that mistrial to have occurred. So not only ruled in the favor. So I've always been like, hey, give me all of your client, give me all of your witnesses' juvenile records. And they're like, those are sealed. And I was like, yet I'm allowed to ask questions about, you know, under 608 about crimes of moral turpitude. So I've used it for discovery. I've used it for cross-examination. Um, I think jurors do care about people who lie, you know, and if it's a crime, a prior instance of something that reflects on dishonesty and then you're trying to draw the connection that they're lying in your case or they're not telling the truth or they're being dishonest, I think that one is more persuasive with jurors <clears throat> than the fact of a prior conviction. That should make us feel about the rules where supposedly what should matter is whether this person is truthful right. or not, not just be branded as a felon right. for a while. Other questions? Yes. Um, how do you deal with client expectations? Because I'm sure that there are some clients that maybe think that, like they want to testify, and it's actually better if they don't, or that like sometimes maybe settlements or plead, like, there are deals that you think are going to be better for them than if they were to go to court. How do you deal with that, um, with varying personalities and expectations with them? Yeah, that is a real, I mean, to do this job, you really have to be uh, a people person in, in ability to listen to what your client's saying and help them understand why they may not be making the right choice, ultimately their choice. For private clients, um, we almost always have a mock cross-examination. So we get everyone in our little office, we have 15 attorneys and our paralegals and our legal assistants, and we get in a room and you know we have a podium and we have one of the other lawyers not working on the case cross-examine this client who wants to testify that you don't think should testify. And I would say 99% of the time after they've been through that experience, they will see how it's going to come across when they're actually subject to cross-examination. Um, that is a good method of convincing. You know, don't take it from me. Why don't you stand in front of this entire mock jury and explain yourself and have them kind of like realize that their answers don't sound so great. 
Um, when I was a public defender, and we certainly didn't have the time or the means to do that, um, you know, you can still do a little mock cross, like, I want to believe you. I believe you. I just don't know if the jury's going to believe you. And you can sometimes get family members or others, other lawyers in your office involved to try to help persuade them. I mean, in Colorado, it's very clear, it varies by state, what a client's right is. So if the client is expecting to win at trial and you haven't told them all of the bad facts and how those bad facts are going to play in front of a jury, then you haven't done your job. But ultimately, going to trial is their decision. I also had a client, I remember when I was a young public defender, I'd gotten a great deal off, the, off an attempt murder charge. He had uh, allegedly shot his wife in the, through the arm, and threw it through in her arm when they were both using crack cocaine. And um, I had gotten him a sweetheart deal, and he was like, I'm not taking it, I'm going to trial. I'm not taking it, I'm going to trial. I started looking at his background. He had been to trial before and been acquitted, so there was a feeling of, hey, this jury system works, you know? <laughs> so I try, someone in my office told me to, you know, kind of lay out some of the bad facts and say, I'm advising you that you should take this deal and have him sign. He's like, I'm not signing that. I will never do that again. I don't know why I did it. It was a bad means of trying to get him to do what I wanted. We went to trial. His wife came in to testify. She got on the stand, and the prosecutor asked her, you know, who shot you? And she's like, I don't remember. I was like, oh, oh, I, like, it was not until that moment that I realized that he knew things I didn't know about what his wife was going to come in and say. Um, it is really hard. Your clients are dealing with their prior experiences with the criminal justice system, things that they're learning in custody. People tell them stuff in jail that may or may not be true. Um, they've got what they want to happen. Some are, you know, sociopaths who aren't going to listen to you no matter what you say. Um, as a public defender, you know, you have to listen to their decision about whether to testify, uh, whether they want to go to trial or take a plea bargain. You know, there are, there are a list of like four things that they get to decide on. And ultimately, all you can do is talk to them and try to use these different persuasive techniques, but it's going to be their decision. Yes. I think it's kind of a related question, but um, can you discuss how you think about using motions pre-trial as a means of building trust with the client so that when you yes. do offer that kind of advice, they might take it more seriously, they see that they're, you're on their side? Etc. Absolutely. It's only really when you get to some place, well, <clears throat> Colorado, we use the preliminary hearing system um, rather than the grand jury <coughs> system, which grand jury is more common east of the Mississippi. and. Um, preliminary hearings are more common west of the Mississippi. So in grand jury, you don't, I mean, we have it in the federal, it was all grand jury, so whatever, we'll put that to the side. Um, really, it's not till motions hearing where you're advocating for your client in a way that they're there and hearing you, not you're advocating with the DA when they're not sitting there. And I think there are a lot of times you bring motions um, always ones that you have a good faith belief in the law, you know, or an extension of the law, but it is a good time for your client to sit there and give you information that you're then using. Like, they're saying, that's not what happened at the stop. Ask about this. or that, You know, and you start to work together collaboratively in the motions hearing setting. It definitely prepares you better if you're going to end up going to trial in that case. Um, it, I mean, your, your client needs to see you fighting for them, okay? And you should be fighting for them. I'm just saying, even when you're fighting for them, they may not always see it because a lot of it takes place, you know, late at night when you're doing research or when you're talking to the DA about, you know, how are we going to deal these five cases or whatever. Um, you need to find places. Bond is another one. I mean, certainly if people are in a criminal justice clinic, I'm sure you're arguing bond. Bond, you're telling their story. When you go to National Defense College, you sit down, the first exercise is meet the person next to you, have them tell you a very personal story, and then you get up and relay it to the class. How does that feel for you as a lawyer to hear someone talking about your personal story? Because that's what you're doing for your client. He's got a job, this is what he does, he has kids, he has, you know, he's got these illnesses he's got to take care of out of custody. These people have to put a lot of trust in you very early and you need to honor that trust and advocate zealously quickly. 
um, for them to, you know, agree with you later when you say, listen, ma'am, I told you I would tell you when I got the best deal that I think you should take, and this is it. I don't think it's going to get better, and I think it's better for you than going to trial. How are you going to end up I did. Um, yeah. So public defenders in general are stretched pretty thin as far as time and resources go. Uh, when you need to find a, an expert witness, how do you go about tracking someone down and being able to get them on the stand? That's a very good question. Um, I have found that cold calling people at universities works really well. <laughs> I, I don't know. Like You can just figure out, I need a psychologist, and you call someone in the psychology department at University of Denver or Colorado State, and you can often find someone who's interested. I, there are a lot of, um, what are they called, listservs, you know, at least like, uh, but I'm on federal ones, I'm on state ones, and a lot of times other lawyers are great resources. I search the news for other similar cases and for experts who have testified, and then I track those people down. TED Talks, good place for experts. Mm -hmm. uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. See what they're like and what they're doing. Yeah, like. exactly. Right, you can see how they're actually going to testify because it's one thing to know your stuff, it's another thing to be a good teacher to the jury. Um, and TED Talk persons tend to have a little more charisma. Um, Hmm. It's hard for, I mean, public defenders, Colorado has a statewide <clears throat> public defender system, so we are at, at a significant advantage. We have people from all over the state, and we have a state central office where there are people employed. I know that in most states it's a county by county, but there have to be, you know, uh, an ACDL. There are these national organizations that are happy to have you. Um, reach out to them for other expert suggestions in the area. Um, I was wondering if you found it difficult coming from like the firm background, um, working with clients who, I know it's a very difficult situation working with uh, clients of the public defender who have very different backgrounds and different situations than you are, but I'm wondering if there's any sort of added difficulty since I'm sure your clients that Always are very different. <laughs> um, hmm. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I went to a high school that was pretty inner city high school, so my background was more similar to my public defender clients than the kinds of clients that I had at Paul Weiss. Um, mm -hmm. But at Paul Weiss, I took on a lot of pro bono cases. Um, they did a lot of pro bono work. So that was a good way to not just be isolating with general counsels from corporations. Um, I think, yeah, you've got to be able to meet people where they are. And, and when they've just been arrested, they're not in a good place. Um, so I'm sure the first year or so of doing that job, you know, uh, I'm not sure I was, I think it's a skill that you develop over time, talking to people. Certainly the other public defenders in the office were so open about the human condition and struggles that it became commonplace to talk about really horrible things. I mean, you know, like you just have to deal with extreme substance abuse and extreme medical conditions, mental health conditions. Um, but if you're doing your job and listening, I, I remember, for example, just reading a file and being like, oh my god, this case is horrible. What am I going to do? And I would get in there, and as soon as you meet the person that's accused of the crime, everything changes. It's a real person. It's a real person in a bad situation. and. I just never thought it was a problem after I met my client. I think everything you read on paper can sound bad. It's also why I kind of understand why DAs, you know, the DAs just are reading the paper. They don't have a client. They're not going to meet the client. And so your job as a defense lawyer is to personalize your client and make them understand why when you met the client, there was something about them that grabbed your heart. Thank you. 
Yes, I'm back. Uh, I think in law school, like, there's such a focus on federal courts. Um, I think it's easy for to forget that, like, most of the litigation happens in state courts, especially from a criminal perspective. Um, as like an experienced like state trial attorney, are there like certain things that you've had to like key yourself into when you're like, you know, in county court versus federal court? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do federal criminal practice a lot too. I'm I'm on the CJ. I head the CJA standing committee, so I head up all of the sort of outside of the federal defender's office, all of the federal practitioners in Colorado. That level of practice, I mean, you go over to the courthouse and you're set for a hearing and your client's the only name for like a three hour window of time and you wait until they unlock the door and you all go in and sit down and there's no one else in the courtroom and the judge is like a football field away <laughs> and you all talk very, you know, yes, your honor, you don't say judge, your honor. Uh, and then you go to state court and 150 people are set at the exact same time and all of their families are there the doors are open you just freely walk back and talk to the clerk behind you know the scene and you know it's like a deli county you're just trying to get your case called right so there's a lot of sharp elbows and um, I'd say uh, both are interesting and compelling they just bring out different features of your personality, you know? So if you're in a state courtroom, I swear you're just standing there trying to talk to the DA for like, you know, you've tried to call them a hundred times beforehand. Whereas on the federal side, the U.S. attorneys like have like five cases, so they always get my right <laughs> You know, you call a state DA and they're like, I'm sorry, we set for trial tomorrow because I don't really have time for this right now. So you have to like be able to get their attention. You have to you know, pester them sweetly, nicely to get a deal um, until you're ready to go to war and then there's no more friends. Um, it ju you just have to ha be flexible and you have to be persistent and you have to, I, I like them both. Um, I have also been in, you know, uni court, super fun, petty offenses, DMV hearings, also a blast. Um, you know, I now I think I've been in every kind of courtroom. And, and, and in Colorado, you know, we have Denver, which is just like, you know, Durham courtroom, I'm sure. And then we have these courthouses that are like from the 1700s, you know, and there's no air conditioning or heating and people let their dogs walk through. And, you know. <laughs> It's like Little House on the Prairie situation, and I love it. I'm like, ooh, where are we going, going to fair play today? And you just don't know what you're going to find. I always walk into the courtroom and make friends with the, with the clerk. You know, number one, step one, clerk's got to love you. Your case will get called. Step two is find the public defender in the courtroom and be like, here. <laughs> you know, and what's up with this DA or whatever. Like they always know everything that I needed to know. And it's a very collegial group of folks. Um, yeah, it's, there's a there's a lot of differences. And then there's of course differences between New York and Denver and LA and Denver. And, um, I think though if you focus on the skills, it doesn't matter where you land. Okay. Um, how do you balance, like, if you get an objection overruled or, you know, they sustain one of yours, and you think you have an appeal, like, you want to preserve that versus, like, it might be better to get out in front of that information at trial, and, like, you're the one presenting it, so you want to preserve that. Like, how do you balance those two things? Mm -hmm. Whew. Uh, good question. There are times when you need to be persistent in the moment. Um, that means... Could we please approach, you know, so you can keep making a record if the judge is adamant that no, you can't approach and we're done with this topic, then you say, man, make a record at the break and they really have no choice but to allow you to do that because, you know, you just need to make a record. If they don't want to hear you, I, I'm not afraid to draft something up after the fact and submit it, you know, before trial the next day and ask them to reconsider their ruling with some more case law. Um, if it's that's all you can do to preserve it for appeal. Um, you also have to be, when I said be flexible, 
if you can't get it in through that witness and you can't get it in through that document, what's your plan B? Because the whole time you're preparing for trial, you need to be having a plan B, C, D, E, F, and G. So hopefully it's not the only way you can get that piece of evidence in. Um, and you can send your investigator out to subpoena some other witness right then and there, you know, that you think can bring in the same information through a more direct route. You know, if there's a hearsay objection, well, where's the declarant? Go get the custodian of records, go get this. So as public defenders, we had our investigators running around getting things um, when you didn't anticipate it or have the person under subpoena. Um, but it's hard, I mean, not naming any names, but I had a trial in New York and the judge there was under the misimpression that you cannot impeach a witness before you try to refresh their recollection. And I was like, that's not the rules say. <laughs> I had a partner who brought in a bunch of treatises once to be like, I am now reading from the treatise on evidence. Um, but, you know, this judge was just adamant. I know you haven't gotten to hear say yet, but, you know, you have to refresh before you can impeach. And that's just not the rule of law. But the judge insisted on it. And I was like, okay. I guess we'll just try to refresh before we impeach. And then you're like, does that refresh your recollection? No. Okay, now let's impeach you. <laughs> so you kind of have to, and the judge does control it. So if you've got to follow their wonky thoughts about evidence, you just have to try to work around it like a river, you know? Like, oh, the judge is in my way. How can I get there anyway? <laughs> One last question, and then we're kind of at time, and some of you may have classes to go to, but you know, we can huddle outside and talk more, and we're not in a rush. Uh, yes? Do you have any lessons learned from negotiating with the other side, or how you can build skills in negotiations early in your career? Yeah, I actually thought that was one thing that public policy taught me well. We had a lot of game theory classes in yeah. Prisoner's Dilemma, um, and there are cases where you don't know who's going to testify against who. Um, I think... Um, as a public defender, you almost always have the same prosecutor you're up against day in, day out. Yeah. So you're, this is really true of any legal career, no matter what you do, your word better be gold. The second you lose credibility, the second you promise something you can't deliver on, you're done. You're done. They're not going to talk to you. They're not going to give you the deal you want. When you say, I've got evidence of this, and then you don't back it up, you're in trouble. So. Number one is only say what you can do, <clears throat> honestly, truthfully, no overselling. <clears throat> um, two is you have to be able, as a trial lawyer, to back it up with going to trial. I mean, there are people who are trial lawyers who never go to trial. And so when they are like, I really want a better deal, and the, the DA is thinking, yeah, but you never go to trial, so I know you're going to fold, right? So if you don't <laughs> learn how to do the trial, that's going to give you the credibility where they see that you know what you're talking about, then, you know, I would think the same thing about a DA. Like, a DA who keeps crumbling and giving me what I want right before trial, why would I deal early when I know I'm going to get a better deal? You know, it's all repeat negotiation. It's repeat players. So you're in a very limited, confined universe of people. Um, when you branch out of being in a particular courtroom or a county or whatever, you, find, you don't know as much about your adversary. Um, so you do all the due diligence you can. I'm not afraid in federal cases to just go look up the prosecutor on the website and find out the last 10 deals that they've done and see what they've given, right? Um, that way, I, when they say, I, I never <coughs> give that, you're like, really? Because I was noticing, um, and then they try to distinguish that case, but you've caught them. Um, so it's a lot of homework. It's a lot of um, your really honoring your promises and your word and developing your skills so that you have a plan B. Plan B is always trial uh, and sentencing. I've won, I've lost trials and won at sentencing or I've lost trials and won on appeal, but you, you've got to have something to back it up um, for them to trust you. And then you've got to do your homework to decide whether you can trust them. That's excellent. Let's, let's stop there, but we can, we can talk more outside the classroom.